So, we're continuing your saga. Mm. And we just arrived in Bhubaneswar, the lotus feet of Sri Gurubindu Maharaj. Mm. Take it away. Uh, I arrived in Bhubaneswar in October 1990. Um, when I got there, there was one brahmachari staying there from England and uh, I began what was probably the most blissful two years of my life. Uh, Guru Maharaj straight... The best brahmachari years when you first come to the mat, yeah? Then I was committed. I was really... I was in India. Um, I'd asked Guru Maharaj for initiation. Immediately, Guru Maharaj, I, we got into the routine in Bhubaneswara where Guru Maharaj would speak for from 8 o'clock to midday every day in the morning. Wow, in Odia. In, he would start at 8 o'clock, uh, from 8 o'clock until the prayers, maybe to 8.30. His Mangala Charan Mang and Kirtan would be at half an hour. Which he would is, be present for the Kirtan? And he, he would lead? He would lead the Kirtan, yes. Like, he what would. Kirtans usually? So, five days a week there would be um, Sriman Bhagavatam. And then on Thursdays and Fridays it was Chaitanya Charitamrita. So we're very fortunate because Guru Maharaj was doing it ISKCON way, word for word, read the translation, and really the whole speciality of that six years where Guru Maharaj was, pre was speaking Bhagavatam was that he was unfluffing Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's purports. And he started from third, third canto, and when he left, he was just coming to the end of the eighth can, uh, end of the ninth canto, and he was about to begin the tenth canto of Sri Bhagavatam, but he left. So in the morning, he would begin his normal prayers: Dhamma Projita Kaitya Vatro Paramo Niyat Saranam Satam Vedya Vasta Matra. So this big long, and if he was speaking those verses in the West. He would speak sometimes for two hours just explaining the verses. Then he would say, so then, and then we will come to the verse. <laughs> just speaking the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. So in this way, Guru Maharaj uh, inspired in us a love of, uh, he inspired in us a love of Srimad Bhagavatam. He inspired in us a love of Harikata because he himself was relishing so much. Uh, I was very fortunate that when I got to Bhuvaneshwara, a devotee left, I think one or two weeks later, Parameshwara Prabhu, and left me with a tape player and a, and a microphone, and all the tapes from the Australian tour that I just completed. So then I began recording, and over the next six years I recorded maybe two, two and a half thousand hours of Guru Maharaj's classes, and um, and evening darshans. So uh, there was long periods there. Only, uh, except I, so I arrived in October. Uh, the, the main deity installation. So the deity's not installed. The temple wasn't complete when I arrived. Uh, we used to have classes downstairs, and an old, just like you see, you know, raw brick, little kind of shackle, ram shackle construction underneath them where the restaurant is now and Guru Maharaj was in his hut and there was a little ramshackle kitchen just at the end that used to catch fire the roof was like a straw roof that used to catch fire every three or four days <laughs> it was quite funny and we'd run out from class and throw water off the balcony to <laughs> stop the kitchen how would it, the kitchen would catch the roof on fire? yeah and they didn't like yeah. change the situation no <laughs> Okay. No, it only happened maybe not every three or four days. It was like it, maybe <coughs> three or four times, but I just remember it occasional used to pastime. occasional pastime. It's quite funny. Um, and and also Grimaj engaged me in the cow saver. So they had one cow for deities. So um, there was an old man there with a bad leg, and they said, you know, they they knew that I was milking cows. I'd been milking cows for a year in Australia. Uh, 32 cows and eight cows by hand. So, oh, so I had I had some good experience. I was in the groove with the cows. So um, did installation in on Nichananda's Trodisi. 
1991. And then soon after that, we went to uh, Mayapur for the ISKCON GVC meetings, first time. Gumaraj was very, uh, especially, had a mood toward Nitendapu on his day. Like, how did you do Kirtan in those days? Oh, you, you can't. That's a good story. You're asking for good stories about Guru Maharaj. I wanted some stories of his dad singing his Kirtan. Uh, I remember the first Nityananda Tradishi. Guru Maharaj would manifest Nityananda Prabhu, complete Mahabhav, rolling. I'd be sitting trying to record and I just kept, I remember the tape player, I just had to keep turning the input down and down and down because it just kept redlining. It was screaming, you know, get I just, the, the, I remember the Asan used to rock because Guru Maharaj would be just rolling around like eyes rolling. And then he would build these kirtans and build and build and build for three or four hours, just Nitai kirtan. No talking, just kirtan. Yeah. And then the thing, the, one, the, the vision I have of the most, there was a young uh, a devotee, it was Digvijay and, what was his name? Ananda. Um, not Vaishnava Ananda. There was one devotee. Old, two old devotees from the local village that met Prabhupada, Digvijay, Dig, Digpati Prabhu, I think his name became Digvijay, Prabhupada gave his Harinam, and the other one was, uh, uh, he was a allopath, uh, not a homeopathic doctor, so he used to treat me sometimes. But they were sitting opposite me, and when the Kirtan reached crescendo, Grumach just had both hands up with the cartels, like, they're going, Haribo, Haribo, and then the whole temple was just, Haribo, Haribo. And then this devotee, I saw tears come out of his eyes that far. Yeah, I like the story of Mahaprabhu. It, it was, Guru was actually your whole body. Yeah. You know, like you feel devastated. I mean, after that kirtan, you'd walk out and you were just... Yeah, that's a symptom of Mahabhagavad. They like, not just, only do they inspire Krishna Nam in you, but like they can give you bhav just by their darshan. Yeah, they were putting, he definitely, Guru Maharaj would put bhav into devotees. I saw it, no question. And, and the other thing, the other speciality I always remember of Guru Maharaj's classes that maybe, I don't know if other, I've, I've spoken to some devotees, but I know for myself, especially when you're speaking Mahaprabhu's leelas in Puri, somehow the whole room would disappear and it was like a, a dream. So you would be there, you would see. The you would, it was like entering the pastime. The Harikata was that strong. And he would speak things about Mahaprabhu's Leela, like when he was explaining the reason for Radhakrishna Pranaya Vrikati. What is this Pranaya Vrikati? And he was talking about how Radharani was on Krishna's lap in Prem Sarovara. And then the bumblebee came and Madhu Mangal said, Madhu Sudan, ciao, Madhu Sudan is gone. The, the Madhusudan has gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Radharani went into immediate separation, even though she was in the embrace of Krishna. And that, at this point, this is Nasa Romani, Nasa Romani, this, the mind, mana peshal of the, the lover and the beloved, where the minds become one. So he was describing at this point how Krishna entered into Radhika's heart. And this next verse after Nasa Romani, Nasa Romani is speaking about this the shellak covering of Radharani's heart and how the sweater, the sweat of Krishna's brow from the the Tapta Kanchanagora, the boiling gold, the boiling golden heart of Srimati Radharani was causing Krishna to sweat and the sweat was melting and and then Krishna entered her heart. So Krishna comes out of Radharani's boiling gold heart unto Krishna uh, by uh, unto Krishna Bahir Gold. This is Mahaprabhu. So he's speaking about these kind of things, you know, this is what it... And you, you would see, you know, you, you're seeing Radharani and Krishna and, you know, it's just, it was just... You'd walk out of these classes completely like transformed. You know, those classes you can't ever see again. So, so Nichiren's appearance day. <coughs> um, and then we went to Gorpanim. There was some fighting with the GBC. 
I was saying my Guru Maharaj wasn't qualified to initiate. <laughs> And I was a little fired, yes, and they were. So I, I, I used some, I, Prabhuji was saying yesterday, you know, to beat crooked people, you have to be a little crooked. So I was, Pramananda Puri was telling me that they, were, they had these GBC regulations where you could not push people to, to a particular guru. Everybody had to be able to select the guru. But in Australia for that whole... Zonal days back then. This was the end of the zonal days. So after the zonal days finished, they made rules that you can't be zonal. They kind of went the other way. So they had been pushing me, Bhakti Grant, you should have taken initiation from this Swami, Prabhu Vishnu Swami was the GBC. So I said this to Pramananda Puri, whose name was Bakwal, he was the Vice Temple President in Brisbane. And he said, yes, we were told, we must do this. So I, I came I fired up and I went down to Prabhu Vishnu Maharaj's room and I said, we have evidence and we're going to submit this to GBC, we're going to make a complaint against you. Yeah, because you're not allowed to do you're this. You're not allowed to do this. And we have documented evidence that this is going. This is happening. The next morning, the same temple president was telling us that we couldn't, that Guru Maharaj was unqualified and we couldn't initiate. He came in, he gave everybody paper. Okay, you have permission to take initiation from Srila Gorgamina Maharaj. Including Tapan Mishra, who had never lived in a temple and never followed any ISKCON rules. So I was telling that before, that it's, it was amazing how these things... So we all went back to Bhuvaneshwara. On Nityananda's appearance day, myself, Karmananda Puri Prabhu, Tathpa Mishra Prabhu, Maturanath, uh, some other devotees got initiated on Ram Navami. And then after this April time, then everything became hot and everybody left. I think I actually I left also. So I went to England for about a month, a month and a half to get a visa. I got a five year visa. And then when I was in England, Guru Maharaj sent me a, a letter and said, Return immediately for Rathiatra. So I came back and I stayed then by myself for, I think until Jamastu. You know, there was long periods there, it was just myself, milking cow. And those times were so blissful, you know, just a perfect sadhana. You get up every morning, chant 16 rounds before Mongolati, Mongolati, go and milk the cow, take the milk to the deity, deities, go and read a little Bhagavatam, come to class with your Bhagavatam. And then slowly, when the devotees came later on, I was saying that because I would sit beside Guru Maharaj and I'd watch and Guru Maharaj's particular, another speciality was that he would always operate on a particular person in every class and there was some special thing. And I had the experience myself that he would just pick something out of your heart that you knew was there but you thought you were hiding from everybody else. And Guru Maharaj, <laughs> and Guru Maharaj would just take it and say, you know... You, open heart surgery open, in an open theater. Yeah, open heart surgery in a, you know, on live stream. So he would, cut, he would cut open the heart, he would take somebody's heart out and say, you know, this is how it is, this is who you are. And then he would put it back in and stitch it up very nicely. And I always could tell who the person was. If Gur Sometimes Gurmaj was doing openly, really loud at some person, whacking and conjoling. Sometimes it was some person two, two seats from the back. And he'd just... Hmm. like this. But then I would know because... I would stand up with a tape player and I'd follow Guru Maharaj down. There was to be some questions. We'd walk down the stairs and go into his room. And there was always this tap. Prabhu, I've got to have that tape. <laughs> you know, because they really... It was the nectar. That was, that was for them, you know. So then I, had, I started this process where I was starting to, re, to, to make copies of the tapes and then distribute them to the devotees as they would come. And the numbers started to come more and more every time Guru Maharaj would do a tour. And then slowly we... I began to try, transcribe and then I'd try to understand where these verses are from and then Guru Maharaj was starting to ask me in the class, where is this, for, can you give me Prabhupada's translation for this verse, this verse and then I would start to collect many books from Chaitanya Chandramoya, you know, all these disparate books, Chaitanya Bhagavat. And then I learned, this, during this period I learned Aurya, I learned to read Bengali and Aurya so I could uh, understand the Ori class and also read the Bengali because the, in the book uh, a lot of the source Bengali. we had a press in the temple and um, yeah a lot of the all of the books were there but they were in Bengali so I learned Ori first and then from there it was very easy to learn Bengali then I could read the verses and tra you know transliterate them and slowly slowly with an, uh, one lady that was there Mahashakti old lady she used to type up I still have those packs of lectures 
So in this way, you know, we went on and on, and Raghav Pandit Prabhu came 1991, I think, uh, 91, 92, 92, 92, because that was, he, uh, when I was in England, there was a Padiatra that went through England and, and um, Europe, and he, he met Guru Maj on that Padiatra. So he came around 92, and by 93, 94, we started Gopal Jew Publications, and we got our first computer and our first little printer, and we started publishing Guru Maj's books. So by 93, 94, we had done um, Bhakti Naipunya, uh, Amrita Tarangini, um, The Waves of uh, Nectar of Devotion, Nectar of, I don't know what the English name was. Um, and uh, Siguru, Siguru Padma, Padapadma, Siguru, not Siguru Dashan, but the book on, on uh, Siguru Charana Padma, based on uh, the commentaries of Narutama and Vishnu Radhi Thakur So, um, and, and just around that time, uh, we had started going to Malaysia collecting money selling paintings and stickers and things and one day uh, uh, Bhakta Raif, Damodar Maharaj and Tapasvi Maharaj, Ananta Prabhu were staying, we were staying in Little India and they said, oh in our hotel we met these really nice devotees um, Urukram and Prankishore Prabhu they are taking shelter of Srila Narayan Maharaj so we had some we had some association uh, already with Gurudev. In '91, I went to uh, I went to Vrindavan here in Kartik, and on Prabhupada's disappearance day, <coughs> I had Gurudev's darshan here in Krishna Balaram Temple, and it was that famous lecture where he said, "You know, Iskon is doing really wonderfully, and book distribution is very good, but unless you go inside the books, it will be like." Kama Mishra Bhakti. So later Guru Maharaj, when he said Shala Narayan Maharaj is a Bhajan Anandi, was based on a doctored a GBC transcription that said book distribution is Kama Mishra Bhakti, but that's not what Gurudev said. Expert tweakers. So um, that was the first time I had Gurudev's darshan, and I remember being absolutely, is that Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Maharaj's darshan? And I was sitting, I'd been asked to carry some video equipment into the temple room, so I was sitting in front of the tripod right behind me, in front of Prabhupada's asana, and Gurudev came in with some devotees from the front of the temple. And when he do, started doing his Prema Dwani before speaking, I was completely shocked at the power and the depth of, you know, I was, I, should, I, I want to start quoting some of Gurudev's introduction prayers, but I... You know, it was just stunning, and I was looking around. I remember looking around, and everybody else was just, yeah. just it wasn't happening. But it it felt like Guru Maharaj. I was just like, is nobody else like thrilled yeah. by this one of this wonderful sound vibration? And then Gurudev spoke. So when he left, I ran after him. And that day, if you look at, I think at Prabhupada's disappearance day ninety one, you'll see that it rained in Vrindavan, because as he was walking out, the Prabhupada Samadhi marble was under construction, so there was a side entrance, but they opened the front construction gates and there was a bus pulled up and as Gurudev walked, he walked through some puddles and I was taking some, <laughs> take, <laughs> taking the Chaturmita from Gurudev's feet because I knew this was a, I knew just from the sound vibration and that's, a, that's the, that's the essence of these Vaishnavas, it says in Bhagavad Gita, you know, how do they walk, how do they talk, everything they do is bhakti. And that's why they tried to keep people from even seeing Srila Gaurabhita Maharaj. You know, when he used to go to temples, they would send all the devotees out, all the brahmacharis would send on Sankatan, so they couldn't even hear or see him. Because when you, go those, when you get those impressions, then if it's not the real thing, you can immediately tell. there's a discrimination, ability to discriminate. So... Um, I was saying that we were in Malaysia, this is 94, this is three years later. 
And I met Urukhom and Prankashopra when we became very close. And we saw that they were producing, um, going beyond Vaikuntha, um, Venugit, and they just... Vi- yeah, Pran- Prabhanavali, Prabhanavali, and Venugit had just been edited at this time because I'd just returned from doing the editing. So we had a lot in, co- lot in common, and I remember I, I, uh, Jagadatma Prabhu sent me there one night to get the books, and we were talking for five or six hours, and I was telling him all the stories about Bhuvaneshwar in class and how Gurmash used to hit us and everything, and they were telling me for many years afterwards we were just stunned. I, we were stunned at what was going on, but we were also could feel your attachment and, and love for your Gurudev. So this reciprocation became very strong and then later Madhavananda asked, just a few, maybe a month later here, they asked Guru Maharaj, can we associate with them? And Guru Maharaj said, yes, you should associate with them. And also we had made some, Bhakta Raif, Dhamadha Maharaj had made some trouble at the Iskon temple. So Guru Maharaj said, don't go to the Iskon temple because it's just causing troubles. So um, we began to associate with them and then I, I thought I'd say that because you're talking how I came to good now and with Guru Maharaj. 94, 95, uh, that was um, in, in a, uh, April, April 94, Guru Maharaj told me to get married. So I was in Malaysia, f- he told me to go and start making money in Malaysia and I stayed in Malaysia from April through to Janmashtami that year. Our devotees went back some time and I spent a lot of time with Prankashore in Urukram Prabhu, Pabana Maharaj. Um, and so 95 I got married uh, in Janmashtami time, just before Janmashtami. I came to Bhubaneshwara. We returned to Malaysia again. I was in Malaysia and uh, we're doing doing some business. Hopefully the shotgun mic doesn't pick up too much of the noise in the background. This is Radhi Kunj and there's always a bit of uh, construction work going on in the background. Yeah, we can pause and do the next. So we'll finish this story. Uh, um, So... I, had, I felt this very, very strong need to go to see Guru Maharaj. And there's a lot of things that the business was really expanding and I was working with another devotee in Singapore and things were going on. I just My wife was under a lot of pressure. Some nights we had up to 18 devotees staying in our apartment. We just got married, all brahmacharis sleeping on the floor doing embankment of separation, and Krishna Katamrita, and all the, all the pe- publication was going on in my house. Guru Maharaj was traveling in Mauritius, we were you know, trying to get the emails working, sometimes we were faxing 120 pages to, to get the editing done. And, and then I just had to go. And in fact, I had a, my wife became very distressed uh, because of the, all the problems, accommodating all of these people. They were, she couldn't even get food, they would eat all of her food. Um, and then I decided to send her back to Bali it was a really amazing thing. So I, I rang the travel agent and I got the ticket, booked it. I went into the, went into the airport and she, she was lying at home weeping, crying, very upset. And some other ladies came to support her. I went into the travel agent, took the ticket on my motorbike. I put it inside a locked box on the back of the motorcycle. You have a key and it kind of pops off. Came back, I took the box upstairs and I opened the box and the ticket was gone. And, and I woke her up, she was sleeping when I returned, and she said, Guru Maharaj just came to me in a dream and said, I should come with you to India. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I knew it was, just the way she said it was so true. And she was only 18, so she was a very difficult situation. So we went to India, she kept getting abandoned. So as soon as we got to India, Ananta, that's, Tapasvi Maharaj was, had been driving Guru Maharaj on Padiatra. He left to go to Singapore. He said, no, you drive the car to, to the GBC meetings in Mayapur. So I had to go to my wife quickly, like within half an hour. Guru Maharaj called me into his room and said, we're leaving within two hours. 
arrange for arrange a devotee to look after them. Unfortunately, there's one devotee there. His wife was also Balinese, so I left her basically by the side of the road and drove off to Mayapur. Okay. And uh, you know, so this is obviously when Gurmaj left. We went to Ramuna that we stopped at Ramuna that night. Uh, in the morning, we drove into Kolkata. We got there about midday, but the flight was delayed. <coughs> so Gurmaj came out from the airport about 6 p.m. Uh, he said, no, we won't go to Mayapur tonight, even though we probably could have made it. And we stayed in a hotel room. And there's a lot of little things at the end there. Guru Mahesh showed me a lot of mercy. Just let me know how dear I was to him. Um, we went up. I took, he, told, he told me to look after the car, so I took his bags up into the hotel room. I was... Uh, two servants. I think it was only two people went, maybe Chari Ratna and, and um, uh, Maram, his servant, were there. So I took the bags up into the hotel room and I was just leaving the room and Grimo said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to, I'll sleep in the car so that, you know, that no problem, we'll be there with the car. And he said, no, no, you're staying right here next to me. So next morning we woke up, went to the, and the other thing he asked me before I took rest was, where's your wife? And I was like, oh, she's in Bhuvaneshwar with Ilapati Prabhu, and she's okay. And he was like, oh, okay. And we took rest together. And I noticed that night, all night, Gurmaj was chanting, you know, so many things were going on in the night. I won't tell so many things, but it was quite amazing. Every time I wake up, <laughs> it was really quite extraordinary. And um, you know, we drove to Mayapur the next morning. <coughs> and when we arrived at the guest house in Iskon Mayapur, there was two stairs, and at the top of the stairs, my wife was standing there. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So Guru Maharaj knew something. And then um, after, after two days, he called me to his room again, and he said, take the car away, go to Kolkata. There were so many envious eyes. They cannot, what to speak of disciples, they cannot tolerate that I even have a, a vehicle. So take the car away. And I said to Guru Maharaj, I can't leave you. I can't go to Kolkata. I can't be that far away from you. But I know one devotee, that devotee I was doing business with in Malaysia, he had another friend who was a disciple of Srila Bhakti Sri Damada Maharaj. So I went, I drove around near Devananda Gaudiya Mat, you know, the Manipuri Mat in front of Devi Gaudiya Mat in Navadweep on the other side of the river. I drove around and they gave me a key to the garden. So I put the car inside the garden there where it was out of view. 